If you've watched this channel much, you'll know that we have a couple of eMotorworks built juice box EV charging stations designed and built before eMotorworks was acquired by NLX and long before NLX declared its sudden decision to exit the US market and leave all NLX and juice box customers in the dark. And you'll also know that in the last few weeks, a project designed to help stranded customers regain control of their juice boxes has made some pretty impressive strides in wrestling the smart connectivity from the abyss and back into the hands of EV owners. Last month, I told you that I'd finally managed to get both of our juice boxes working with the Juice Pass proxy app, and today I'm going to explain just how we did it all. It's a little bit of a different video, I'm not on camera for a start, and more of a tutorial than anything else. So because I know we all needed a bit of distraction right now, let's get on with it. To start, I want to acknowledge that your particular installation will vary a lot, depending on what type of juice box you have, how you're comfortable with coding, and if you're someone who understands some basic networking and computer fundamentals. Today, I'm going to focus on the software solution to get original juice box hardware working as originally intended, giving you the ability to change charging currents as required by your specific needs. I'm also going to focus on situations where you might need to get two different charging stations working side by side using Juice Pass Proxy, Home Assistant, Unraid, and a few other things to get everything working as it should. But, and this is important, if you've got just one juice box charging station, it should still be working just fine without access to the official NLX servers. Sure, the smartphone app won't work and you won't be able to start or stop charging remotely, but it should still work as a non-smart charging station. And if you're someone who wants some smart charging functionality but doesn't want to do the hoop jumping I'm about to, keep your eyes peeled for a drop-in control board replacement for original V1 and V2 juice boxes from Open EVSE. They've already got a replacement board in testing and you will eventually be able to open up your juice boxes and replace the proprietary hardware that runs proprietary software with an open source EVSE controller instead. With all of that done, let's look at what you're going to need for this and I'm going to try and explain what's going on as we go. And obviously, disclaimer, this video is for educational purposes and in tweaking this setup, you could potentially cause damage to your charging station, your car or your home. Do not change settings if you don't understand them and don't try to get your charging station to do things it wasn't designed to do. Additionally, you should only ever install a charging station on a circuit that's capable of safely delivering the maximum power those units are rated to deliver. That means if you have a 40 amp juice box, it needs to be on a 50 amp breaker in order to satisfy electrical code. Do not install a juice box 75 on a 40 amp breaker and then try to restrict its power using software. Based on reports I've heard about fires involving charging stations, the majority seem to be because they were installed using incorrect breakers and then software derated. Basically, this video shows you what I did, but you are on your own if you decide to do it yourself. Okay. First, I'm going to assume that your juice box is already on and connected to your home network. If you've never connected your juice box to your home network and you're using it as a standalone charging station, this tutorial might not be for you. But it's worth noting right now, you can still use the original JuiceNet or NLX app to connect an original juice box to your home network via the unit's built-in Wi-Fi antenna. Assuming you've already got your juice box on your home network, you're going Going to need to figure out what the IP address is. There are many different ways of doing this, but the easiest way is to log into your home's router administration screen and see if the charging station has an IP address associated with it. It might not show up as juice box on your router, but if it's an older V1 charging station, that's the ones in the grey or black or black and orange box, 
it might show up in your network as Zentry OS or something very similar. Here you'll see I'm looking on my Unify Network controller and you'll see I have two juice boxes. I've already given them a static IP address, which is what you'll need to do to make use of the juice pass proxy. If you're not sure how to do that for your router, now's a good time to pause this video and come back when you've figured out your juice boxes IP address and more importantly, switched it over to a static IP address. Optionally, at least right now, you'll also want to decide if you're going to stop the juice box from calling home to NLX's servers. This is most important if you're someone who has multiple juice boxes set up for load sharing. Load sharing juice boxes that attempt to call up NLX's now not quite but nearly dead servers will default to a non-intelligent mode where they deliver a tiny fraction of the available power if they can't get a sensible response from said servers. And unfortunately, at the time of filming this, while the servers are still working, the load sharing feature has been unceremoniously killed. So if you're wanting to do load sharing, you're going to need to nix that ability to ET phone home. I jumped into the firewall settings of my Ubiquiti system and prevented my juice box from accessing the internet completely. Next, you should head to the juicerescue.org website and read the documentation for the Juice Pass proxy. There are three different ways it suggests you can get this running, but I'm going to focus on the version of control which blocks the juice box from calling home and which also forwards all the packets from the charging station to the Juice Pass proxy. And for good measure, I also set up a DNS server that told the juice box that the domains it wants to reach are actually just over there, locally available on the network, essentially a DNS redirect. That last step is optional because, as I'll explain a little later, you can use the Juice Pass proxy program to use Telnet to regularly check the juice boxes sending its data to the Juice Pass proxy instead of NLX's servers, and if the juice box has the wrong information, to then jam the correct information back into the system. When I did this setting, update UDPC to true, the juice box regularly lost connection with the juice pass proxy, but many people find this is the only thing they need to do in order to get it working. This is the option as detailed in the juice pass proxy documentation as option 1B. I went for option 1A and added option 1C. I went for option 1A and added option 1C for good measure, which is why I used Pi-hole, again, plenty of details online, to create custom DNS records for the domains you're seeing on screen right now. If you do this too, you'll also need to make sure that your router is telling the juice box that it needs to use the Pi-hole as its DNS server. So far, so complicated. At this point, I'm going to assume you've got Home Assistant ready up and running on your home network. You'll also need to understand what an MQTT server is. And again, I'll link to some videos explaining these below because there are tons online. You'll also need to be able to set up Dockers somewhere or somehow. If you've got this far in the video and everything is making sense, you are most likely good to continue. Before you try and set up JuicePass Proxy, you will need an MQTT server up and running on the network, and you'll also need to know its IP address and any login details you'll need. In my case, I already got MQTT running on Home Assistant, and again, I'm just going to tap that in with my JuicePass Proxy. Then you need to install JuicePass Proxy in a Docker container using either a command line prompt or something GUI based like Docker Desktop. But because we personally use Unraid for our home media server, I'm going to spin up a Docker image for JuicePass Proxy using Unraid's Docker feature. And obviously, because I'm showing you some of the things from my home internal network, you will see some things blurred out, passwords and the like. In my my Unraid setup, the easiest way to install JuicePass Proxy is to head over to Apps and then to look for JuicePass 2 MQTT. Click on it and then click on Install to bring up this window. But, and this is very important, you're going to need to change the repository from what it pre-fills in to a more up-to-date repository. To do this, 
You'll need to go to the space where it says repository and replace what's there with Ivan FM forward slash juice pass proxy, all one word, colon latest. Make sure you set the networking type to host and then we can set up the other bits of the system. First, you'll need to input the juice box host variable. Uh, that's the fixed IP address for the charging station you have. And then you'll need to put in JPP host, which will be the IP address of the computer that you're running juice pass proxy on. You'll also need to ensure you've entered your MQTT host information, including its IP address, user and password details for that broker that you set up earlier on. Again, you can't get any of this to work if you don't already have an MQTT broker set up and working. I'm not going to walk you through that again because there are so many other videos online about it. So looking back at our Docker settings, you'll need to give your charging station a name in the device namespace and you'll also need to choose what settings you want for update UDPC and for ignore NLX. If you blocked your juice box from calling home, it won't be able to call NLX directly but this app can pass on information from the NLX servers to your juice box. So unless you click ignore NLX, it will still get communication from the mothership. However, when I did this and before I set up a custom DNS entry for the various servers the juice box normally looks for, I didn't get things working as they should. So my personal configuration uses ignore NLX equals false because I have blocked NLX's servers from being reached anywhere on my home network. I also have update UDPC set to false because again, due to those custom DNS entries on my Pi-hole instance, I don't need to force the juice boxes to go back to a server that I've built because thanks to that little DNS hack on Pi-hole, my juice boxes legitimately think that they are talking to NLX. Okay, with all of that set up, you should now be able to spin up your Docker. And then if you look at the logs, you should start to see things populating like this. And this should show you that the Juicebox proxy is working. And now you just have to wait. With all of that working, we're going to head over to Home Assistant, where you'll need to head to the MQTT integration. You should now see your juice boxes appear as devices within the MQTT setup. Click on them and you should see something like this, detailing how much energy is flowing and the ability to set your max current. If you see all of that, fantastic, great, well done, it is working. If you don't see this pop up, check your MQTT and also check that the juice pass proxy is working as it should. You may need to look at the logs. But if you have issues with that, the Discord server for the Juice Rescue and Juice Pass Proxy program is a great place to head and ask for help. I'll make sure there's a link in the down below. You'll see in this window that we also have two different sliders. One is max current online slash wanted and the other is max current offline slash wanted. The offline one won't appear initially as it does take a few minutes to populate that within Juice Pass Proxy. But when you have have these, you can now control the current that's going to be delivered by your juice box to your EV. Set the current to zero for both of these values and your charging station will pause, set it to a higher value and your charge station should begin charging. But I'm not going to go through all of the different automations you can make here, nor am I going to go through the different dashboards and ways that you can integrate this into your home assistant setup because Everyone's setup is different. This, for example, is my main charging dashboard, which is still very much in progress and built using the excellent charger card integration that you can find through Hacks. But at this point, you might look at this all and say, hey, you have two juice boxes and you'd be right, I do. And sadly, setting those two up was frankly a bit of a nightmare. Because the Juice Pass proxy program only handles one instance, 
you do need to have two JuicePass proxy instances spun up, each with their correct settings for their respective charging station. And while some of the devs on the JuicePass proxy project assure me that I can get two different juice boxes and two different JuicePass proxy instances playing nicely on the same local network, the only way I could get everything to work was to create a separate virtual network or VLAN for the second juice pass proxy and juice box. When I did that, it sorted out the networking traffic between the two and everything worked as it should. It didn't before I did that. And now I can luckily use automations to decide what to limit my respective charging stations to, depending on if one or both of the juice boxes are being used. I'm eventually going to change this to use a Python script that one of the team on the Juice Pass Proxy project designed, but for now I have both charging stations working using home automation automations. If I plug one vehicle in, that juice box will get its current limit set to 40 amps, the maximum allowable on the 50 amp circuit, but only after the other charging station has been told to set its limit to zero amps, ensuring it also can't pull power. But if that second charging station suddenly gets a vehicle rock up and plug in, another automation will kick in that sets the first charging station's maximum current down to 20 amps, verifies that has happened, and then and only then ramps up the second charging station's maximum current to 20 amps, which means that both charging stations are pulling 20 amps each, sharing the maximum 40 amps of available power. For me, all of this works and it was a fun challenge to implement, but I'm not going to lie, if this sounds like too much trouble, it's okay. If you're going to replace your juice boxes with something else though, do me a favour. If you're going to buy a new charging station, don't just throw your old one away. Donate it to someone who can use it, or perhaps offer it up to someone at the Juice Rescue Project. There are links in the down below. Thanks for joining me today, and if you've got some thoughts, make sure you leave them in our Discord chat room, our Patreon page, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure that we can remain 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There are a range of different tiers that you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just over $10 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters. Alan Brim, Jim, Sarah Horlock, full name, Todd Johnson, Roderick, Stuart De Spain, Rupert Ronson, Larry Fenis, Dala, Wendy Kelly Buddenbaum and Kay. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your moment of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll also find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations. And we even have a good old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at, address also linked below. And of course, if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below. Don't forget that Halloween is coming and we've got some great designs for the season. We've also got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we also think this one is well worth a look. See you soon and as always, keep evolving!